smart. Um, <clears throat> the place that we're using smart is in the, the co uh archipelago, uh, marine fisheries management area. Uh, so the marine fisheries management area is uh, the boundary is this dark blue line that you can see. And then um, within the marine fisheries management area, there are three community fisheries. Um, the first one up here, um, and then there's a, there's a boundary there, and then you've got the second one here, Delta Cove, and then the third one um, in, the, in the south of the archipelago. Um, and uh, until, until the marine fisheries management area was declared, um, the community fisheries were the only form of, of local management. And within uh, their management structures, you can have uh, no-take zones, or which are called conservation areas in this um, context, which are the red, um, and fisheries refugia, which are the yellow. Um, when the marine fisheries management area was declared, um, it brought all of this buffer zone into the, into the marine fisheries management area boundary. Um, this green protected area, which uh, only allows family scale fishing, and then also um, this other zone called recreational areas, and these um, only allow um, scuba diving and, and snorkeling. No fishing is allowed to take place in, in these sites. Um, so this is the area in which we're which we're using SMART, um, and just to kind of give you a bit of background as to um, the process that we've been following. So I work with. Uh, the marine kind of work in Cambodia began in about um, 2010, but really the work with the marine fisheries management area kicked off in, in April 2012 with this um, with the Darwin project, and that was really um, focused on providing technical support and capacity building to the government and local partners to um, to gather baseline data that would support the creation of a marine fisheries management area, which for all intents and purposes is a, is a multiple use MPA. Um, and that's really when our engagement began in full with the, with the community fisheries, so trying to uh, revisit their governance structures, um, looking at the, the existing committees um, and doing re-elections, and then um, using those as a kind of base work, base work basis, sorry, for um, bottom-up management at the site. Um, and patrols sort of began in a fairly, um, I guess, uh, not very structured way in about 2014. And these patrols um, simply were the community going out and with a GPS um, and the GPS would record a track of where they went, and sometimes they might record if they encountered someone. So it's very kind of basic um, data collection, which didn't provide us as managers with any information about really whether or not the community were actually going out, because you could just put a G GPS on any old boat, uh, or take a GPS on a GPS on any boat. Um, and it wasn't really giving you any more information about what was actually happening um, when, when the patrols were taking place. So in October 2015, we started collecting data using the smart um, blog books. Um, so this is kind of formalizing the process a bit more, so taking down information about uh, your encounter with uh, illegal fishing boats, uh, for example. And then in January, uh, 2016, um, Palin, um, who you just met now, ended uh, a regional workshop in Phnom Penh on SMART. And this was really where um, the data model uh, was, this is the point at which our data model was designed, um, and then uh, introduced uh, for the, we really kind of introduced SMART in full. Um, and then uh, in June 2016, um, the MFMA was officially um, proclaimed. And so any of the smart patrolling that was done before that was simply focused in the community fisheries. So just to remind you, those were the those were those three um, those three zones. Those three zones. So that's where this, initially the patrolling took place. But then once the MFMA was declared, that enabled um, patrolling for, sort of for the whole site. Um, and then, 
As Callan just mentioned, um, we've just been uh, we've just had some follow up training provided by WCS um, from uh, people from WCS in Cambodia and also uh, WCS Bangladesh, where they're using um, smart in a kind of terrestrial mangrove river island system. Um, so there is they're using it in an aquatic environment, um, and this has really kind of made us think a bit more carefully about our data model, um, and our data model is basically, your data models frames what you collect on a patrol, and, um, and then it sort of structures the analysis of your data. So, um, for example, if you're going out on a patrol, what was found, um, and then from the analysis side, you can pull up things like how many patrols per month, or how many instances of illegal activity. Any questions so far? No. Nope. Everyone looks no, wrapped. Wrapped. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, just to simply provide like an overview of how SMART works. Um, so you go out and you collect your data, um, hopefully by boat <laughs> in this case. Um, and then you, in our case, we write, uh, the community writes the data down into logbooks. Um, and this data is then inputted into the computer by um, a one of our counterpart staff in the Fisheries Administration. Um, and I think Sophie is using, maybe using CyberTracker, which prevents this slightly clunky paper form system. Um, and obviously there's issues with transfer, can be issues with transfer of data, but for now that's the system that we're using. And then once you've put your data in, then you can run an analysis based on what you, um, what your data model uh, allows you to collect and you can run reports um, and we, these reports are submitted to um, both provincial and national government. Um, we share them internally and we also feed them back to the CFI, to the community fishery. And then this analysis will allow you to uh, ultimately plan future for patrols based on what the feedback that you're getting. So it, essentially using it in an adaptive management way. Um, but you can also use the analysis for other purposes such as monitoring and evaluation um, for the, the project, or the wider project. Um, so just to summarize briefly the information that's captured, um, you can get information on, simple information on the patrol itself, uh, the location, so where people went, um, quite importantly, where are people in relation to the zoning, whether they're inside or outside a specific zone. Um, if you encounter a fishing boat or uh, a, a type of gear, what kind of interaction took place? Um, did you inform them of the rules or did you find them? Um, the people that were on board, uh, the types of fishing gear that was used, um, and then the action um, that was uh, taken. So just to kind of uh, summarize a couple of uh, results. Um, so we had this was in 2016, um, so just showing the number of patrols over the year. So you can see as we got to the end of the year, there was a, a decrease. And this actually is um, partly, well, in large part due to one of the community fisheries having an issue with their boat, but also some um, internal issues, um, which we're trying to deal with at the moment. But there's um, provincial elections taking place, so we can't re-elect the Community Fishery Committee until the provincial elections have taken place, which is a bit of a um, a bit of a blockage at the moment. So we're trying to see if we can get other communities to, to fill that gap. Um, then the next uh, chart that's showing um, how many boats uh, were moved from a protected zone. So this is simply if boats were in a conservation area, they shouldn't be there, and they're told to move out. Um, and then the final um, bar charts just showing uh, the number of uh, verbal versus written warnings um, over the course of the year. So it's quite a lo large number of um, written warnings are being issued. Um, the first time people get a verbal warning, then there's a written warning, and then they can have uh, uh, more formal uh, fines taking place later. So, okay. I'm just going to go into some of the limitations. Um, 
SMART was ultimately designed um, with terrestrial patrolling in mind, um, and as a result, uh, a lot of the data models that are available are, are uh, they, they originate from a, a terrestrial uh, setting, and this is one of the challenges that we came against um, when designing our data models that we were being informed by terrestrial um, protected area managers who didn't have that much insight into the uh, into the challenges that you'd face in a, an aquatic environment. Um, your detection power um, with SMART is is can be quite limited. Um, with any kind of patrolling, your detectability is going to be influenced by your frequency of patrolling. Um, but it's also something worth considering, not just for SMART, but for any kind of, um, I guess, enforcement tool is thinking about the time of day or um, the areas that illegal fishing might be taking place. Um, and your detectability of those is, is going to vary. So how you interpret your results about your, the effectiveness of your enforcement is going to be influenced by detection. So for example, if you're doing all your patrols in the day, but illegal, fish, illegal fishing is happening at night, um, then your results might show that there's no illegal fishing happening. But actually, um, that's not accurate. Um, also, night patrols um, can be a bit of a limitation. I think, again, this is not just um, in the context of SMART, but with patrolling and, and enforcement in general, um, you need more resources to, to go out at night in order to ensure that your crew or patrol ag um, your agency is safe. Um, so it's something worth considering if, if a lot of illegal fishing is happening at night or illegal activity. Um, in our case, we have um, the communities conduct the patrols. Um, sometimes they're accompanied by government staff. If they're accompanied <coughs> by government staff, then they have um, the power to issue fines um, and written warnings. If they're not accompanied, then they can only inform people of the rules and ask them to move out. They can't. Um, they don't have the legal authority to move people from the area. Um, another limitation is that SMART is not in real, real time, which I'll come on to, to address in, in a moment. Um, also, there's, um, at the moment, or until really quite recently, there's really limited international and regional application of SMART in marine protected areas. Um, and there's that, it's quite hard to find um, learning from other sites. Um, so we tried to contact WCS in Belize, but didn't really get anywhere in terms of um, sharing data models or any kind of, um, I guess, lessons learned. Um, hopefully now that's changing a bit, but um, when we started out over a year over a year ago, there really wasn't much out there. So um, I guess kind of moving on from those limitations, I think there are quite a few considerations. You like what? Those. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, looking guys. to share smart in, um, in other areas. Um, so firstly, thinking about how how fast um, how fast data versus how fast. Huh? 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 Sorry, Kate. Right. At Anne and Dewa, can you hear us? Um, oh, okay. perfect. Cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dewa says, oops. <laughs> <laughs> so cool, yeah, I was it. saying about um, so smart's not a real time data tool uh, uh, tool, but um, I think if <coughs> you're looking at how fast you need data versus how fast you can respond. So vessel monitoring systems, um, there are a number of different options out there. Um, will provide you with real time data, but those really are only well. One of the main uses of those will be to provide rapid, rapid uh, information that you can then 
respond re rapidly to. In our case, we don't have uh, the manpower or resources to respond rapidly, um, so SMART is more appropriate. Um, with uh, It might be also worth thinking about um, what can be done from the land. Um, so uh, in, in Belize, I know um, there's been some work on looking at kind of more strategic positioning of lookouts um, and using those as the way to um, identify where illegal fishing is happening and then send out a response rather than just going out on patrol in the hope that you might encounter an illegal fishing boat. Also intelligence, if you have a good um, intelligence network, responding to that could be, um, could be more effective uh, in some ways and getting your, getting your patrol team to respond to intelligence and being a bit more targeted in your activity. Um, I think where we are at the moment as well, um, in this kind of review that we're doing internally about SMART and how we use it and moving forward is thinking about SMART in the context of wider monitoring and evaluation for projects. So for us, um, we, want, we really want our SMART data to be able to help us to show spatial and temporal information about incursions into no-take zones and try and compare that to the um, biological indicators that we get from these sites so that we can say whether or not we're actually having an impact. Um, one thing, uh, another um, thing to consider is, um, and something that we need to think about, is what does SMART tell you about um, the actual fishery? And you, SMART's really quite limited in that capacity because you're, you're monitoring your patrols, you're not monitoring your fishing boats. Mm -hmm. um, so the, vessel monitoring systems or sort of very simple um, boat tracking systems might be more suitable if you wanted to look at um, what's happening with the fishery, where fishing pr pressure is occurring, and, and the kinds of landings that you're getting as a result of that fishing pressure. And that's, um, I don't know, that's being done in Myanmar at the moment, uh, where they've got trackers on individual boats, and then they're, they're measuring the landings from, from individual boats. You can't do that with SMART. So just thinking again about where you might, if you want your enforcement tool to have other purposes, um, then you know, that's another thing to consider. But fishermen generally are not that keen to have um, vessel monitoring systems, or it's a bit of a conversation to be had. So um, the next thing to consider is your, your data, data model design. Um, so Paola and Palin are working pretty diligently at the moment on thinking about whether or not we really need to totally restructure our data model. Um, and this basically will affect how we look back on our um, previously collected data because there are certain changes in the data model um, that will mean we can't analyze the data in the, in the same way um, if we change it at this point. Um, also worth thinking about who are your, who's collecting the data. Is it a community member or is it a ranger or is it someone who's you know with a, a relatively high level of education? Um, that might affect or influence the um, system that you use, so cyber traffic, for example, could be can be made to be very, very simple and just pictorial, so people can just click on um, icons rather than necessarily need to read and write. Um, and then also the next level up, thinking about who's, who's going to be processing and managing that data. Can they use a computer? If they can't use a computer very well, do you really want them to be inputting lots of data? Um, and then from... I would really recommend um, seeking a review uh, for your data model from other marine sites, and that's where we're at the moment, is trying to seek some review from um, the smart, uh, the wider smart community, um, to see if there's things that we've overlooked. Um, then, oh, sorry. And then uh, another consideration uh, is thinking about how, <coughs> how SMART fits within the wider context of local marine or fisheries management. And by this I mean, um, so for example in Cambodia, um, vessel licensing is really, really poor across both the uh, small scale and commercial fishery. Um, and one of the, in many fisheries you would hope that if you encountered a boat, 
um, that you would say, okay, this is boat number XXX, um, and then if you saw boat XXX again, you would have a record of that, uh, of that number. In our case, there isn't vessel licensing that's done in a particularly formal way, um, so you have to use the identifying features um, to note repeat offenders. Um, so that's more, more would be perhaps about the captain's ID or um, their name. But it's a little bit harder because when you're tracking people, uh, people move around a bit more. A boat is, at least you know it's the same boat, whereas the captain might, might change or the, the crew might change. So that's just thinking about how SMART fits within your wider governance of marine resources, I think is, is worth considering. Um, and then just some final points is looking at who your enforcing agency is. Uh, again, that relates back to capacity, resources, skills, etc. Um, can the data that you need think, can the data or information you need be captured in another way? Um, SMART can be used for collecting lots of other things in addition to um, patrol data like biological information records can be collected through SMART. Um, that might be really useful in your site or it might be over complicating things. Um, and then finally, uh, just trying to encourage people to join the Smart Marine Task Force. Um, I think that, I think FFI, we're, we're lucky that we're not, um, as we're not a, a partner of Smart, we have a bit of autonomy in how we use it and how we kind of um, are able to discuss it internally because we're not fully signed up to being like Smart is the best tool ever. So as a result, we're able to be a bit more critical or, or look at it um, with a bit more um, rigor, I guess. Um, so I think the Smart Marine Task Force is a good way for us to be involved, but not necessarily committing to saying we're going to sign up and say this is the best thing since sliced bread. Um, yeah, so I think that's me done, but if anyone has questions, um, if there's any points I haven't addressed, then.